Uh, what was I going to say? Yes. A uh, short time ago, Paul Gosling, to my right, produced this report, A New Union, A New Society, Ireland 2050, which was looking at the economic, culture, constitution proposals for, for a new Ireland, which rung a bell, of course, with us in Fela, because we've had a couple of events over the last few years which have been very stimulating just on this, this one thing. We had a couple of events last year where the issue of a united Ireland come up very strongly in a number of debates and perhaps not in as abrasive a way as you might have imagined even two or three years before, uh, which led us to feel that, you know, actually, you know what? Uh, this question of a united Ireland is now on the agenda. It's really on the agenda. You don't have to be dismissed as being some sort of mad provo if you use the, the term a united Ireland or a new Ireland or whatever. So one of the signs, I think, of this is that a respected economist, such as such economic journalist such as Paul has done the report, and so that's why we asked him to come and, and talk. Just very briefly, in terms of biography, um, I thought before I contacted Paul two things that were completely wrong. I thought he was a journalist with The Independent based in London. It turns out he's lived the last 18 and a half years in Derry and also that while he did, while he was a correspondent for a while with The Independent, he is a freelance journalist. So that's the biography, that's the report and now he's going to tell us about it. Usual format, Paul will speak for a while and then we'll switch to, to you having questions, points to make or whatever. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak at the Fado. It's a real privilege. Um, United Ireland. It's, it's a political and an economic challenge moving towards United Ireland. But actually, the economics. Sorry, are you in the wrong room? Do you want to go to the civil rights room? <laughs> as soon as I start, the, the audience starts leaving. <laughs> uh, if only the same thing happens in the other room as well. Being better. You should go in and collect the ones that fit. Because it says downstairs we were to be in lecture theatre too. I didn't know. Calm down. Actually, two of them are going to be Do you actually want to run next door and see if there's anybody in there that thinks they should be in the audience? Most of them should be in the audience. Apologies. Okay. That's that's the first of many walkouts. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've, I've had many walkouts over the years. Don't worry about it. Okay. So United Ireland, a, it's an economic and it's a political challenge. But the economics are way easier than the politics. But the two things definitely connect. Just to make clear that I don't invent this stuff, I'll read from David McWilliams, who is, in my opinion, the most respected economist in the South. I'll give you a couple of paragraphs of quote from him. Uh, the northern economy that was strong in 1922 is now weak. The southern economy that was weak in 1922 is now strong. The union with Britain has been an economic calamity for Northern Ireland. All the people have suffered, Catholic and Protestant, Unionist and Nationalist. The Republic's economy is now four times larger, generated by a workforce that is only two and a half times bigger. The Republic's industrial output is today ten times that of the North. Exports from the Republic are 17 times greater than those from Northern Ireland, and average income per head in the Republic at €39,873 dwarfs the €23,700 across the border. Dublin is three times bigger than Belfast, far more cosmopolitan, and home to hundreds of international companies. And that basically is, in a nutshell, broadly, why the United Ireland conversation makes sense to have. Yes, the politics are changing, but the economics have already changed. And the Northern Ireland economy, let's be blunt about it. I mean, I've been criticised when I've called it a basket case, so let's not use that type of wording. But it is weak. The economy of the South is strong, and the economy of the North is weak. And it's not universally weak, it's disproportionately weak. So the UK's employment rate, I always talk about employment rate, I don't think we should talk about unemployment, because actually the key thing is employment, especially in Northern Ireland, where we have so many people that are economically inactive, that would like to work, but aren't in work. So let's not talk about official unemployment statistics, which are manipulated, let's talk about the employment rate, the percentage of people of adult working age that are in work. In the UK, it's 76%. In Northern Ireland, it's 69%. In Derry, Straban, is 56%. So firstly, you can see the economy of Northern Ireland is weaker than that 
of mainland UK. But secondly, you can see that actually we do not have an even economy across the north, because clearly we don't. Because where I live in Derry, it is very much weaker than it is on average in Belfast. And within Belfast, as all of you know, it's very much weaker in West Belfast and in East Belfast than it is in places like Lisburn and Castle Ray. So there's, we've got a fundamental problem about how the economy in the north works. And the truth is, we don't properly have an economic policy in Northern Ireland, and we don't have a sub-regional economic policy in Northern Ireland. So it takes an age to get from Derry to Belfast because there's not been adequate investment, and there aren't jobs in Derry because there's not been adequate investment over there. And that feeds into the inequality, but equally it comes out of the fact that if you go back to the 1920s, there's never really been a distinctive economic policy for Northern Ireland. The South has developed its own economic policy. The North has broadly just retained the economic policy of GB. And GB's policy, back in the 1920s, was based around manufacturing. Well, thanks to Margaret Thatcher, the manufacturing economy of Great Britain was destroyed. But we have never replaced it with anything of any significance. We are essentially a service economy. But with the problem with that is... Because of the South's lower income tax, sorry, corporation tax rate, that basically if you are generating profits, it makes more sense for you to be located in the South. So what we end up with in the North is what's called the cost centres, the things that cost you money, which don't generate profits. So we end up with an economy orientated towards the service industry, which is doing call centre work rather than actually generating profits. So that's part of the problem we have, that we've never despite the periods of the evolved government here, we've never developed our own proper economic policy. And you can see that in the fact that the undergraduate numbers in Northern Ireland are way lower per capita than they are in anywhere else in the UK. So we're not investing in university education. Also, we're not sufficiently investing in vocational education. We're not having the right vocational skills. We're not having the right graduate skills. And we've got far too many kids leaving school without basic skills partly because we've got a grammar school system, which is great for those who go to grammar school, but leaves out the people that don't. So you have large numbers of kids that effectively stop going to school, particularly working class boys, actually, who stop going to school at the age of 14, 15, don't emerge with adequate skills to get a job. And then you have the problem which feeds into both the unemployment and economic inactivity figures that we suffer from. So we have to reorientate our economy and we fail to do that. And clearly, the border has been a problem. Partition has been a problem. If you go to somewhere near the border, the economy is weaker than it is in parts of Belfast in particular. And we have very weak infrastructure. If you look at the productivity in Northern Ireland, well, firstly, the UK's productivity is lower than the rest of the G7 economies. Secondly, within the UK, Northern Ireland is much weaker than the rest of the UK. And thirdly, the North West is much weaker than the rest of Northern Ireland. So we have a triple whammy in the North West in terms of productivity. And then because we have weak productivity, then we don't generate the jobs coming in. And the productivity is off the back of not having the right skills base and not having the right infrastructure. You know, anyone that tells you how long it takes to get from Derry to here will tell you how weak our infrastructure is. And you can see this flow through in terms of what the economic performance of Northern Ireland is. EY, one of the accountancy firms, consultancy firms, uh, believes that this year, last year, the economy in the South grew by 7.8%. This year, it's growing by 4.9%. In Northern Ireland, it's growing by 1.4%. So almost four times faster growth rate than the economy in the South than in the North. And the CBI in Northern Ireland has just issued a warning that we're on the edge of recession. What that means is that compared with the, with the South, the South has got higher pay, it's also got higher costs, so let's not you know, disguise the facts. It's got, a similar, it's got similar employment rates, but it has an open economy. And because it's got an open economy, that means it's much more connected to what's happening around the rest of the world. So when the rest of the world's doing well, it does well. When the rest of the world does badly, it does badly. We are cushioned more than the South is. So they benefit more when good times, and we have some level of protection more than the South does when things go badly. But, as I say, we've had a lack of 
devolved economic policy, and we've had a lack of in commitment investment into skills and to infrastructure. So we've got weak roads, weak rail, and also telecoms. And much of Northern Ireland, we still don't have the telecoms, the digital infrastructure that we need to have. And it has to be said, you know, that we've also suffered because of the differential in terms of the corporation tax rate. I'm not someone that likes the idea of lowering tax rates in order to attract companies, but it has to be said that he's one of the factors that has caused the South to be much more effective in attracting inward investment than the North has. But it's also worth mentioning what's happened since the Good Friday Agreement, because, to my mind at least, we were promised a peace dividend off the back of the Good Friday Agreement. That peace dividend has not come. And you can see that <coughs> statistically in the fact that the gap in employment rate between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK has actually grown since the Good Friday Agreement was signed. There has been a failure by the UK government to recognise its responsibility to deliver economically off the back of the Good Friday Agreement. And that is one of the reasons why peace has never really been fully solidified in Northern Ireland, because we don't have the economic base, we don't have the job space that we need to retain the peace process. And we're now faced by the prospect of Brexit. And Brexit clearly, by any definition, by any logic, is going to be damaging to the UK. Jacob Rees-Mogg was talking in, the other day on Channel 4 News about the fact that you only really be able to tell whether Brexit worked or not after 50 years. Now that means, <laughs> that is code for saying, <coughs> don't be right. surprised if we've got a few hard times ahead of us. I won't be around in 50 years' time. A lot of you in this room will not be around in 50 years' time. So basically people were sold a pup. But the thing is, not simply is Brexit in the short term going to be bad for the UK. It may be OK in London. It may be OK for the Somerset hedge fund that Jacob Rees-Mogg is a major investor in, especially as they've invested in Dublin as well. Uh, it will probably be OK for Crispin Ode of Ode Asset Management, who put in £87 million into the Leave campaign, and he bet that the value of sterling would fall after the referendum. On the back of that, he gained 220 million off it. So he is all right, and he's incidentally bet further that share values will collapse because Brexit will go badly. So those are the people who invested into Brexit who are actually not necessarily expecting things to go that well. And I don't think things are going to go well. We don't know what damage Brexit will do. It's a reasonable guess that probably the economy in Northern Ireland will be two and a half to 10% smaller than it would have been if we hadn't had Brexit. But we know from the last recession in 2008, that recession didn't hit the whole economy on an even basis. People in London, some of them obviously lost their jobs, but things in London weren't as bad as they were in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland suffered more than anywhere else in the UK, partly because we were connected to the Irish economy did it badly, but also partly because recessions hit most of all, hit hardest, the weakest economies. And Northern Ireland has the weakest economy in the UK, and the North West, plus West Belfast, plus East Belfast, have the weakest economies in Northern Ireland. So we suffer, you know, the old phrase, other people get a cold, we get the flu. So we can expect, especially the border areas, to be hit badly by Brexit. And it's worth mentioning, there's a lot of conversation about what Brexit says about where we trade. And there's been a lot of conversation led by the DUP to say, well, what's really important out of Brexit is we retain the East-West links, because actually we do most of our trade with GB, and that's where the trading links have to be retained and strengthened. Well, the truth is it's more complicated than that, okay? which is that in terms of the value of transactions, the big transactions, the important transactions are East-West. They are things like Bombardier, Right bus, etc. Those are where the big money is. But in terms of the number of transactions, it's actually north south. There's far more transactions that go on between the north and the south, and more is sold from the north into the south than is sold from the south into the north. So, in terms of the big companies, they are worried about markets in GB. As far as the small companies are concerned, the sm small and medium enterprises, their concern is they're worried about keeping over north south. And so, actually, the damage from Brexit, if there is a damage to north-south, if we don't have open borders, a lot of SMEs will be very badly hit. And that's people probably that you know 
very well. You probably don't know too well <coughs> William Wright who runs Wright Bus. We have, though, what we can call the English problem. And the English problem is actually that Brexit wasn't really about a UK vote. Yes, Wales marginally voted in favour of Brexit, but the issue was in England. And it's an in issue about how democracy works in England. And it's an issue about the fact that, in my opinion, basically because I'm an old-style old socialist, I, I believe that democracy has to be underpinned by a fair society. It has to be underpinned by a fairness in terms of the equalities and the distribution of wealth. And what we've seen in England is a redistribution of wealth towards the wealthiest. And actually that's happened in particular since the global financial crash of 2008. Because what happened in order to keep the markets going was a lot of money was created and pumped into the economy through quantitative easing. And what quantitative easing means, and it's, you know, it's a very boring phrase, but it's a very important thing to understand. Because actually what it did was it bought assets. And by buying assets, it pushed up the prices of assets. And that meant that the people who owned assets got wealthy even more wealthy than they already were. So quantitative easing was a redistribution of wealth from ordinary people to the super rich, the multi-millionaires, the billionaires. There's more billionaires now as a result of 2008 financial crash than there was before. So there's a sense of anger. People don't necessarily articulate it in quite that way, but there's a sense of anger that people know other people got rich and they didn't, that real incomes were collapsed, they fell as a result of 2008. Real incomes have not returned to the level of 2007. So within England, there's this sense of grievance, of anger, that people have not done well where other people have. And that has been felt through that vote, which is really a vote of protest in the Brexit vote. And I interviewed Yanis Varoufakis a few months ago, the former finance minister in Greece, and his, his wording was similar to this, which is that he said, the Brexit was a result of the failure of English regional economic policy. And he's completely right. It's because that the South East and London sucked more and more and more resources and wealth out of the whole of England. And places like Sunderland and Stoke, other places, have got worse and worse off. And that has fed through. And of course, pretty well no one in England gives a toss about Northern Ireland. And actually, pretty well no one in England knows the cost of Northern Ireland, which is probably just as well in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> because actually Northern Ireland has the UK's highest public spend per person, absolute. The net cost of EU membership for the UK, you know, net after you, the, the membership fee, less what you get back, is 8.6 billion a year. The official figure for the subvention, the, the subsidy to Northern Ireland per year, is 9.2 billion pounds. So in other words, on official figures, it costs more to have Northern Ireland within the UK than it does for the UK to be a member of the EU. <laughs> if the English ever get a, a, an idea that that is the truth, <laughs> then they will not be quite so keen on having Northern Ireland in the UK. And actually, as an English person, I tell you, pretty well no one in England actually wants Northern Ireland as part of the UK. <laughs> You know, it's actually, this, it's in, one of the things that's really interesting as a result of what's happening about Brexit and the fact that the DUP is, is the parachute for the UK government is about this stuff about, you know, what Theresa May has said. The Good Friday Agreement, I meant to check the wording, I forgot actually. The Good Friday Agreement says the UK government is neutral in terms of whether Northern Ireland chooses to be part of the United Kingdom or part of the island of Ireland, the United Ireland. Theresa May has not said that. Theresa May has jettisoned the political commitments of John Major and Tony Blair and said that her government is not neutral over the place of Northern Ireland within the UK. So actually, we've got a position where Theresa May has gone back on the Good Friday Agreement, which of course the DUP is very happy about, but that is something that we need to be politically aware of, and I don't think anywhere near enough fuss has been made around that fact. But what I would argue is that because of the cost of that subvention, we'll look into the figures in a moment, but um, the cost of that subvention means that, to my mind, there's a decent argument to say to British taxpayers, right, OK, this is Northern Ireland being in the UK is costing you a lot of money, 
But actually, it would be a lot easier for everyone if you gradually reduce that subvention as the North gradually becomes part of a United Ireland. I don't believe that we should go for a big bang solution. I don't think we should go for a big bang loss of the subvention from the UK government to Northern Ireland. We need to get to a negotiated solution where we move stage by stage towards a united Ireland in which we continue to get some support because in the longer term it's in the interest of the UK taxpayer, or the British taxpayer I should, I should say, that actually Northern Ireland is no longer part of the UK. But the other thing is, to go back to this other point, will the subvention continue? Why does the UK government pay nine plus billion pounds a year to have Northern Ireland as part of it? Why does it pay per person more for public spending in Northern Ireland than it does for London or the South East or anywhere else in, in Britain? I mean, that doesn't really make sense. So I don't think it's going to happen, you know, can continue indefinitely anyway. But then we've got the other figure about, because the subvention is the is the reason why it's been given that a united Ireland is impossible, because the South couldn't afford to pick up the cost of the North. Well, it would be difficult for it to pick up in one go this £9 billion, if that is actually the figure. But the thing is that it, on, on a balance sheet, the cost of Northern Ireland to the UK is £9 billion a year. In reality, it's not, because there's a lot of things in that £9 billion a year that are really things that you wouldn't transfer as a cost over to United Ireland. So, for example, the contribution to the armed forces of the United Kingdom, well, that wouldn't obviously transfer over to the South. The debt interest payments, well, you have to argue about that, but, but hopefully you wouldn't have to transfer your contribution, the Northern Ireland contribution, to paying off the UK debt as part of an arrangement once we've got a United Ireland. Mm -hmm. Similarly, small things like the, you know, the royal family, etc., there is an argument that some things you know, would have to be increased in the South. So, for example, when I put out the, the original documentation, Esmond Burney, a well-known unionist who's also an economist, said, well, the, the South's armed forces would have to increase in size. I'm not actually persuaded by that, actually. But beyond that, we've now got another report. That, um, Mark Daly, uh, Senator in the Irish Senate, has commissioned the report from Gunter Thumann, who's a, a, a former IMF economist who was involved in the German reunification. His calculations come down <coughs> to less than £1 billion in terms of subvention, because if you look at some of the details, then actually you can get even below that £5 billion a year. <coughs> but some of these things you have to negotiate over. So, for example, the pensions costs of British public servants who worked in Northern Ireland. Who pays for those? There's also... A big issue over the civil service and the rest of the public sector. And this is where a lot of these conversations become very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, broadly what I'm arguing is that the reason why the Northern Ireland economy is very weak is because we've got the wrong economic policies in place. If we had the right economic policies, whether we continue to be a Northern Ireland or whether we're part of a United Ireland, we'd be in a much stronger place if we adopted the same economic policies in the South. But I really don't want to be arguing that we should have very low rates of corporation tax. But perhaps that's one of the things we have to accept. But equally, one of the other reasons why we've got a high cost base here is because we've got a much larger public sector here. And you'd save 1.7 billion a year if you reduce the size of the public sector in the north, the same as that in the south. Well, the experience in GB is that once they have cut the size of the public sector, it creates more jobs through other things that happen around it. But the jobs you create are low paid, typically. They're self-employed often. They're casual often. So actually, you're moving towards an economy that actually perhaps you don't want to <coughs> argue for. So what I'm saying is that you... You can probably cover the job loss through other things because you've got a more dynamic economy. But it's not necessarily, if, we're, if you know, those of us in this room who are socialists, it's not necessarily the economy that we're entirely happy with. So there will be compromises. And people have to think about those compromises, how happy they are, that you know, if we have a united Ireland, to make it affordable, do we have to accept the, the lower tax rate of the South? Do we have to accept that the size of our public sector is smaller? Do we have to accept that some of those people that would have been working in the public sector are moving into lower paid, casualised employment? So those are things that we need to discuss. And 
there are other challenges as well. And when I talk to people, and I have talked to a lot of people around this, the one thing which is a big blockage in terms of talking about United Ireland is the National Health Service. That, that absolutely, if we're moving towards United Ireland, the first thing we have to do, actually, the most important thing, is to get the South to have a National Health Service. You probably cannot sensibly talk about United Ireland with people to persuade them until the Health Service in the South is where the National Health Service should be in the UK. And we're not where we should be by a long way in Northern Ireland. But, you know, the situation in the South is not acceptable to large numbers of people in the North. We also have to give assurance to pen about pensions and welfare support. And actually what I'm saying is very similar, I'm afraid, uncomfortably <laughs> true as it is, to what Peter Robinson's saying, which is that to have a conversation, a sensible conversation about United Ireland, we don't need, we shouldn't be talking in broad terms. We have to be talking about some of the details and we have to negotiate out some of the details, like the health service, like the pensions arrangements, like the welfare support arrangements, like the tax levels. We also have to recognise that we need more investment in the north, in Donegal as well, because investment drives a performing economy. We have to decide what we're going to do. And the other thing, of course, in the north is that a lot of our economy is based around retail, and retail is in a very dangerous situation. So we're, we have to be talking about a reshaping of the economy of the north. We have to be talking about the pay rates. I've got most of these copies have gone now. Actually, I bought a few of these. And I've done a series of reports uh, with Pat McCarthy, former editor of the Derry Journal, looking at how we move possibly towards United Ireland. And I've had conversations with a number of leading political community figures in the North. And the premise started from, can we please stop talking about identity politics? I do not like identity politics. I don't, whether we're talking about Trump or whether we're talking about Brexit, whether we're talking about what's going on in Hungary, what we're talking about in Northern Ireland, I don't like identity politics. We should be talking about class-based politics. We should talk about the, the redistribution of wealth. We should be talking about those things, not about which religion we happen to be uh, uh, connected to or which family we were born into. And the premise of these conversations was, if we talk about values rather than identity politics, to what extent do we have a commonality of view? And to a large extent we have, but then we come down to the fact that people use the same word to mean different things. So fairness means to a unionist politician something quite different from what it means to a Republican politician. But these are very interesting conversations to have, and we need to have more of those conversations which move out of the traditional boxes that we're born in. And I'll give you an example about one of the things that I think that would be very helpful, which is that if people in the South who identify as British could get British passports in the same way that people in the North who are born here can choose to have Irish passports, that actually seems to me to be fair. If it's important for my daughter, for example, as she does, to have, to have the capacity to have an Irish passport, I don't see why the union's politician, Willie Hay, can't also have a British passport when he was born in uh, Donegal. That seems to me to be fair and to apply the principles of Good Friday Agreement on a, on a broader basis. So I think that we need to, to be open to those conversations. Um, so what I'm saying is that economically, the United Ireland, I believe, is achievable. I believe that the things that we need to do to get the economy of the North to work are essentially the same as whether we're part of the United Ireland or whether we're independently governed. But because of the size of a United Ireland, clearly we achieve economies of scale. It becomes a much more achievable economy. But the argument does depend to a large extent who puts it forward. Because actually the conversations I've had with people on the unionist side, as much as anything, is about saying, I'm not going to support anything that's been put forward by Sinn Féin. So there has to be a broader platform arguing for United Ireland. Because if it is an argument that is seen to be the territory of Sinn Féin, it probably cannot in the short term be achieved. It has to be achieved by having a broader conversation in which a broader group of people are persuaded that United Ireland is achievable and that they then go on to argue for it. Thank you. Oh.
Paul, thank you. Uh, very stimulating. I, I'm going to do a cheeky thing that chair, chairs sometimes do and, and uh, gazump everybody and ask the first question, if you don't mind. Which is, uh, I, I was in, in uh, former East Germany one year after the wall came down. I met a lot of young people in particular who were very, very scared and very worried about how things would work out. They, in fact, you, they, didn't, they t didn't talk about reunification. They talked about Anschluss, which was, you know, takeover. Like the, the Nazis took over Czechoslovakia or whatever. And, you know, their, their, um, their fears actually were justified in many ways. When you look at how, you know, people in universities and businesses and everything were just thrown out of their jobs and f West Germans were moved in, how despite the big subvention that the West made to the former West made to the former East, the former East is still badly off, etc, etc, etc. So what I'm asking you is, what if I said to you, look, I'm a unionist, and that's my fear for your nicely painted picture of a, of a United Ireland. Mm. And, and it's important to recognise next year, <coughs> and this is amazing for someone of my age, it's going to be 30 years since German reunification. Mm. And there is still no real sense of equality between the East and the West. The East is still much, much, much poorer than the West. So that is absolutely a warning. I actually don't think the same thing would happen in Ireland because of the strength of Belfast. I think the, the risk is that you would have that corridor, Belfast to Dublin and to an extent down to Cork, and that would be the, the economic powerhouse of a united Ireland. And I think Belfast is too strong and too close to Dublin for the same things to happen. In, uh, that happened in Germany. But one of the conversations I had was with Mark Durkin, and he said, if you look at the, the numbers in terms of the Doyle, that he does not believe that a united Ireland could have a government in the Doyle functioning without unionists being part of that government. So I think if that plays through, and it's difficult to see, and given that it's difficult to see how Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil can ever properly be in cabinet together, I mean, you, it, it, becomes, it com becomes rational to believe that the situation in Ireland would not be the same as that in Germany. Clearly, there is a risk, but even though there is a risk, in Germany, there is a lot of tension. There's, it's very worrying that, fa that fascism is on the rise in East Germany, but living standards are higher now than they were before reunification. Clearly, it's not a perfect model to copy. It's not where you want, and I think you'd want a more gradual evolution towards unification than was achieved in Germany. And in a sense, because we essentially have the same economic system, which they didn't in Germany. I don't think that the experience of Germany should be assumed to be the one that we would have. Thank you. I just got this picture there of the DUP being the, the umbrella or the parachute for Fine Gael. <laughs> <laughs> um, folks, it's over to you. Comments, questions for Paul, or whatever. There's no mic. Uh, anybody want to say anything? Would you feel that uh, European <coughs> subvention whether structural, regional, or whatever, could um, result in a uh, positive impact on in drawing the um, two economies together. Yeah, absolutely. I don't. I don't think that the European Union would be providing cash that could be used uh, for revenue spend, mm -hmm. but with. with, with with the exception of our education. I do think that there's a strong argument, and, and this report, the reports I've written, the, the report from Gunther Tuman also says basically, yes, we believe the EU would be sympathetic. And, and there's, you know, there's an Erectus committee looking at reunification, which Mark Daly is chairing. And, and that, that is working from the assumption the EU would be very, very sympathetic to reunifying Ireland. And, I think that the way that would work would be investment into this transport infrastructure and also investment into supporting the development of education. And those are the areas where basically the North is very weak. So yes, I do think they would be very supportive. Mark Daly spoke at Fela last year on, mm. on his report, by the way. 
Jerry? All of it, the British government are saying that the subventions are around 9.2 billion. And Mark Daly um, believes that it could be in around a figure of 700 million. Mm. And that's without factoring in the potential positive impact of the unification in terms of the economy. Is there a, is there a way or, or is there a possibility of quantifying an, an actual figure? That uh, the partition is costing the people here. No, I mean, it, there's, there's so many assumptions that you have to make, and it, and it's important to say the mark, the, the figure you're quoting about Mark Daly, which is also the Gunter Tuman figures, is the is the report they did together. That assumes that you got a public sector in the north the same size proportionately as that in the south. So, yeah, it's it's jumping the gun a bit, you know, because clearly. It would take some years to, for you to gradually reduce the size of public sector employment down to equivalent levels of that in the south. So you, you're not going to get there. You know, it's not it's not that they've done an exercise which says the real figure for the subvention now is 700 million a year. It's saying, well, if you take these various things out, and they are some of them pretty optimistic assumptions. So, for example, about the fact that the UK government accepts that we do not have to pay any continued cost towards uh, debt repayment, uh, debt interest rate repayment. Um, and it also assumes that basically a large chunk of the pension liabilities go to the UK are not ours. It is a, it is a fairly, I mean, these things, you know, actuaries spend their lives trying to work out, you know, what assumptions you're reasonable to make, and they get it wrong a lot of the time. So th there is no properly calculatable figure. A lot of these things are based around the assumptions of what will happen. The, the, the pensions calculation they've done is based around assuming that the same outcome happens as the UK negotiated with the EU in relation to European civil servants and what the, the liabilities for the UK government are. Hello, and then well, Tom. What you say there about the South and uh, their economy? It is true to say they're on a vile theocracy for 50 years, 60 years, Archbishop John McQueen and so on, but the one beneficial thing from a theocracy is usually the education system is very good. I've been abroad with agencies of the state here, and there is no comparison with Enterprise Ireland and the ID down south. I mean, some of the chunks that I've been with to America, to Germany, you're supposed to be selling skills and so on here, the wrong people in the wrong jobs. And until you put salesmen in to sell something, you're not going to sell anything. In this country, in the north there, we have some extremely clever people. And you'll see that. You drive out around the country, you'll come across a huge business. Who's in there? Two PhDs, maybe. So we have very clever people. But here they don't understand what a smart economy is compared to a knowledge economy. Knowledge of itself is no use. You have to be smart. And down south, they've been smart. And one thing they could do up here is immediately replicate Enterprise Ireland and the ADA and start and make the kind of uh, context. There's no point in going to Germany from someone who's never heard of William Butler Yeats, for example. Do you know, it's ridiculous and embarrassing. And until that changes, it doesn't matter how much money is put in here because the British government are enablers for here for people not to produce. And I'm hoping that there will be change and some people will say, we, can, we don't need to be looking about the money. We can build our own economy in the whole island. We're clever people, and I don't accept this superior angle of intellectualism at all. I think that as people, we can build our own economy here. And I would like to know when it's going to start. Yeah, I, di I didn't catch every single word of that, but I think what you're saying is that to invest in I isn't very good, and the IDA is very good, in which case, that's what you're saying. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, because, uh, you know, Everyone I know, talk to, says that if, if the IDA worked for the North, then actually we'd be much better off. The other thing is that my understanding, and I've spoken with people about this, is that the IDA has much greater policy influence in a positive way over the government in the South than uh, InvestNI has in the North, which may be misstating it a bit because the chief executive of Invest in I, of course, is a former bag carrier for um, uh, Ian Paisley Sr. Uh, and has therefore very strong political connections with the DUP. Um, and it may well be that the 
from the point of view of lots of us, it's the wrong political connections rather than the absence of political connections. But the point is, if you had an agency that was promoting jobs and investment in Northern Ireland, you would want them to be able to influence the education system, to influence the infrastructure investment in ways that InvestNI has not done. Because you can't simply say, well, we build um, offices and we'll get people to fill them up because you have to have the whole package. You have to have people with the right skills. You have to have the ability to get to places. You know, if it takes you, as it does, two hours to get between Derry and Belfast, and if you've got an airport with virtually no flights, then it's very difficult to get someone from another country to invest in that place. You know, it's not rocket science. So, you know, we, we, we don't have things, and it's exactly the same in tourism. You know, how many, how many agencies do we need for tourism, you know, there should be one tourism agency for the whole of the island. You know, it's just mad. And we've got, in the north, we've got the Causeway Coast. In the south, we've got the Wild Atlantic Way. They pretty well connect in Derry. <laughs> and there's no promotion about how those two things can be promoted together. I mean, it's mad. Mm. So, Tom? Well, thank then. you very much for your talk. Very stimulating. How do you, I mean... How would you think the impact of Brexit is going to be on between the economy of Britain and the economy of the Republic? And will that have a negative impact on us? It will have a negative impact, but we just, I mean, until we know what the deal is going to be, and if there is a deal, then really we're just guessing. I mean, and it changes every week. You know, yesterday there was a, 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 an opinion piece published by Michel Barnier. And that moved the European Commission's position, I think, in quite a long way in terms of conciliating with the UK government. So as of yesterday, the chances of us leaving the European Union without a deal reduced significantly. My feeling 10 days ago was there's a 40 to 50 percent chance of us leaving without a deal. As of yesterday, because of what Barnier wrote, I would say we're down to probably 25, 30 percent chance. So when you've got that level of, of gap between the two sides. And I still don't know. I just do not know how you get a solution, actually. Because I don't know how you get a deal between the two bits of the Conservative Party in the House of Commons. I don't understand what solution you can achieve that you can sell to both Kenneth Clark and Jacob Rees-Mogg, for example. And I don't see how anything that can get a majority of the Conservative Party together or a majority in the House of Commons is acceptable to the European Commission and the EU26 outside of Ireland and the UK. So, and without having that sense of how we get a deal, it's very difficult to know what it's going to do. If we assume that the border is going to stay open, if we assume that somehow we're going to stay in the single market or the customs union in some way, or at least within the customs union, then maybe we can survive without very much damage. But if we end up leaving without a deal, then it's horrendous, both for the north and for the south. Because, the, I mean, there is investment going on into the ports in Cork and Dublin in terms of getting goods to go straight to Antwerp and uh, uh, Calais and places, uh, uh, but, and Rotterdam. But, you know, most international trade from the, from the south goes through GB at the moment. And if you're going to have border checks, then it's going to be very disruptive. So the Irish economy is going to be very badly affected if we don't have a sensible deal out of all this. But if we had a deal which would be completely unacceptable to the DUP, but if you had a deal where the north stayed within the UK and stayed within the EU under the proposed arrangement, the preferred arrangement of the European Commission, we would actually be in the best position of anyone in terms of Brexit. The obvious sen common sense solution has been vetoed by the DUP. Well, what a surprise. <laughs> We're going to go one, two, three, four. Okay, Jim. Come up with, uh, Paul. Yes, like Tom, I'd like to thank you for your, uh, your presentations today. Um, and I would particularly like to thank you for the book that you brought just before this one, because I think that one for me uh, is probably the best economic argument that I've saw, uh, <coughs> certainly in the last three or four years, in relation to the reunification, the economic reunification of the island, whatever about the politics, as we've said in previous reports. The reason why I liked it was because it dealt with uh, the economic argument at a macro level. Okay, when you looked at 
the um, performance of the southern economy compared to the northern economy, performance of the northern economy in, in comparison to the south. The relationship that between both, the relationship between the two and the British economy, and then the three economies in relation to the European Union. So I think at that macro level, your arguments were compelling in terms of the prospects of a viable economic reunification of this island. And I think that we really need to try and ensure that the debate is at its basic level and that it's detailed. Because the debate, I think, is only beginning on the credibility of an economic, uh, the, the island performing as a single economic entity. And so we have got to address the arguments that are out there in people's head, particularly, I think, people in the, in, in the North, and particularly the unionist people in the North. Because I work in Dublin, in the Shannon, with Niall O'Donnell, who's a senator. It is alarming the state of partition and the partitionist thinking that there is in the, in the political class in the South and in relation to We are aware of it here in the North. When you go South, it's even more frightening. And when you come to the economic question, it's even more frightening again. Because people will say, we have, we're holding on to what we have in terms of prosperity. So I think the economic argument has to be at the most basic level it can be. It needs to be led by economists who are credible, mainstream, orthodox, if you like, or whatever you want to call them, but people who deal with the general facts who can convince others out there the merits of it. And I think that that's where your last document, and you, you told me earlier it was incorporated into this document, so the big arguments that at the moment have to do around the subvention in the north from Britain. That is a crucial one, as George said. We need to unpack that in, in whatever way we can. We also need to ensure that we don't use the success of the southern economy to beat the northern economy and unions over the head with it. We've got to come up with a new all-Ireland economic argument that benefits everybody and demonstrably is beneficial and is proven by people like yourself you're economists who understand the economics of the argument. And I do, because I was at a meeting just yesterday uh, with some senior Sinn Féin people, and they were concerned about the, the issue you raised earlier about the health service. <coughs> and I think that's fair enough for political parties to be concerned about all of those things. But the economists, I think, at this, this is my own personal view, we need an economic argument, a, a, a clear cut, raw, detailed economic argument on why today there, it, it's, it's, it's in the interest of people of this island to end partition economically and, the, and, and the, the arguments that support its viability, the other side. I, I don't think fundamentally one can ever separate politics and economics. No. The two things go together. And, you know, people say to me sometimes, well, economics is boring, but actually you can't do anything politically unless you sort out the economy, you know, as someone who's been in politics. You, you, the two things are inseparable. So, yeah, you have to, you have to address them together. The, the report from Karl Hubner some years ago made the case about the, the how both economies would increase in size through reunification. I have to say, you know, openly declare, I support politically a united Ireland, no question, okay? But I do think, economically, it makes sense. In actual fact, if we had not had such a succession of failed governments in Northern Ireland, the argument would not be anywhere near as strong. Anyone who actually had applied basic, sensible economic tools to running Northern Ireland would have created a much stronger economy within Northern Ireland, even without reunification. As it happens, you get economies of scale by achieving a single uh, United Ireland, and the economic tools used in the South are broadly effective, and the economic tools used in the North are broadly ineffective. Okay. Yourself? Well, very interested in your um, your comment around the potential trade offs that would need to be in defining what a new economic model would be for an all Ireland economy. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I'd be interested to know through your discussions um, and, and, and coming up with the, with the outputs of your research um, and any thoughts of your own around what a, a new economic model might look like for a 32 county state because I think, you know, you've alluded to the distribution issues that there are in the north, you know, um, even though the macro picture in the south looks really positive, there are massive distribution issues in the south and the long tail of the TFC is, is it still impacting in the south as well. Just be keen to get your, your perspective on that and, and, you know, there's been writings by the likes of Thomas Piketty um, who's 
2013 when the distribution of wealth. You know, is there any learnings from that that could be applied in the new econo economic model? Um, and you know, we, we do operate in a, in a very narrow sphere of economics, and there are seven other, six other um, schools of economics thought that, that, that aren't adopted here uh, in this part of the world. So is there, is there an opportunity for a more plural approach? I'm going to assume that a number of people in, in the room are politically more towards the left than to the right, okay? Um, and I am very concerned at what is happening globally, politically. And I, don't, I believe that within a globalised economy, your options in terms of how far you can move against the mainstream of international political development are very limited. The problem that we have is that if you look across Europe, there's only one country, as far as I'm aware, where a social democratic party is in a strong position, and that is in GB. There's not in any other country in Europe a strong social democratic party. And you look at what's happened. It, well, you could say in Greece there is, but that was after the collapse of um, uh, PASOK. Uh, if you look what's happened in Spain, where you've got the Social Democrats in power on 20% support, you look what's happened in Germany, where they're down, the, the SPD is down to about 25% support. You look what's happened in France, where um, Hollande was destroyed because he didn't have a coherent economic position. If you look <laughs> at the political parties in the South, the <coughs> Labour Party, I don't, God knows what it's at now. You know, it, we, social democracy stroke socialism is in a very weak position internationally and that's because somehow the recession of 2008 was blamed on <coughs> social democracy which is very difficult to understand I mean there was the, I, I was reading a review by Martin Wolf in the Financial Times last week and he said basically it's one of the he didn't put it in these terms but it's one of the great contracts that people like George Osborne said the, the, the recession was caused by excessive public spending by governments, mm -hmm. when of course it wasn't. It was caused by the under-regulation of the banking institutions. And actually, the policy response should have been tighter regulation, not deregulation and austerity. So we've ended up in a very weak position. But we have lost that political argument, So, which is a very long way round of saying that unless we can create some sort of hegemony of thought in which people understand what has happened, I don't know how we can create a political model, an economic model, that is redistributive. We have to go for the long game where we win people over. And I don't, we're in such a weak position to do that now. Niall? Um, thank you both. Um, Paul, very much enjoyed uh, your presentation. Thank you for taking the time to uh, deliver it. One of the issues uh, in respect of Brexit, which is going to confront us, or four of the issues which are going to confront us, very quickly, uh, possibly as, as soon as October, are uh, the issues of citizens' rights. Um, and numerically, there are four uh, Irish citizens in the North uh, stand to lose uh, our mandate, our franchise, at a European Parliament. Uh, students who will seek to perhaps study in Dublin, Galway, Cork, uh, will not be able to avail of the media uh, liberties that, that currently present. Uh, mutual recognition of qualifications. My brother's an electrician. Uh, that hasn't been made, made clear. Uh, and most concerningly, perhaps, uh, to most people, access to the European Health Insurance Card, EHIC. Now, whereas Erasmus, Francis at uh, the Parliament, and mutual recognition of qualifications could be resolved with uh, political will. EHIC is a financial um, issue. Uh, so any of us who would seek to travel to France would not immediately be able to walk into a French hospital uh, post-Brexit, uh, other than if you had your own personal health insurance. And for those that might be in poor medical health, uh, perhaps diabetes or a history of heart illness or stroke, might not be able to avail of uh, health insurance uh, quite as readily as uh, a younger person uh, and they could effectively be grounded but, but my question is the prospect of a financial um, reconciliation emerging from 
uh, the southern government could have its opportunity to grasp a very small nettle uh, this year by qualifying how much EHIC will cost for Irish passport holders in the north and actually resolving that citizens' rights issues for what is immediately going to come upon us in Brighton. And I just want to pick your brains, as it were, as to how you feel the Irish government uh, might consider uh, rating the, the or, or under, under rating the health insurance uh, for Northern Irish passport holders uh, post Brexit. I, one of my one of my various roles as a freelance writer and broadcaster is that I produce uh, a monthly podcast on Brexit developments for our charity in Derry. Uh, they call me their Brexit expert, which is a bit overstating it because no one's really an expert on Brexit, <laughs> including the people who do it every day of their lives. But it does mean that I've interviewed people uh, who are confident that if there is a deal in leaving the EU, it will involve certainly the European <coughs> health insurance card having mutual recognition so that the UK potentially, with a deal, would stay within the European Health Insurance Card and there would be a reciprocal agreement between the UK and EU member states that it would be mutually accepted. Because actually, that wouldn't, logically, that wouldn't be a, a net cost to anyone because you know, the benefits to some people would be counted by the benefits to others. So on that, there could be a resolution if there is a deal. But you're quite right, if there was not a deal, I looked at the Irish government's website, which says that the European Health Insurance Card is available according to where you live. So it's not according residence. to your nationality. Yeah. So for example, my daughter has an Irish passport. She lives with me in Derry. Potentially, she loses the right to have an EHIC because she doesn't live in the South. Um, her mother lives in the South, so it may be that uh, we can get round it. But, I mean, and so we'll have a lot of grannying, possibly, you know, the Derry term in terms of getting availability to use that. But it clearly is unacceptable. Um, but it is one of those issues, I think, that a lot of negotiators will be looking at about trying to get uh, benefits um, continued. You know, not just around that, but around other things as well. And I think the Irish government really... I mean, to be honest, when we don't have a deal and we don't know what a deal is going to look like, it's just very difficult to get lots of these things sorted out. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. The residency thing does come from the EU as much as from anything anyone else. Uh, yes. You know, so it's not yes. just a... So it's not... Uh, exactly. It's, it's not UK something issue. the Irish, uh, Irish government can yeah. decide on its own. They can't yeah. just give EU rights right. uh, and decide it will underwrite them because it has to be <coughs> EU recognition. But I'm told, I'm told that there are, by people who should know, that there are active conversations as part of the deal negotiations to keep the UK within the EHIC. But without that, even if you've got an Irish passport, you won't logically be able to avail of the EHIC. Yeah. Uh, Finally got to you. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, many women here. Um, as somebody who comes from the West, I find it very interesting, your perspective on the IDA and, and, um, and all of that. And what a, you, you paint a very rosy picture. <laughs> and I think we need to bring into all of our conversations around economic reunification, um, the disparities in the regions, and in particular... Can you hear at the back? Yes. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the deficit in the infrastructure, like the very basic infrastructure of telecommunications, roads, rail, uh, all of that, um, because I think without that, um, we're missing something. In. And without that, you couldn't have faith in what you've been told, because you, and you know from the growth like the four point whatever percent growth is not um, what it might appear to be when you, when, you, when you look underneath it. But I suppose what I want to ask you just in terms of that is what role you think that the ECB might play in, in addressing all of that. Because why I think it's important, say I want to, to come to Belfast by rail, I have to go across to Dublin and I have to cross the Eastern. I can't get any direct connection. We have a, an international airport in Knock Airport, yet I cannot get a flight to Belfast. What do we need to do to be able to have that connectivity? And I think we need to be doing that now 
and right now, and that's where the pressures uh, need to be coming as well, because I think that will, will help where we want to go. But as in terms of the ECB role, and the other thing I just want to ask you is, how vulnerable do you think we are at the moment in terms of a crash? If you're taking the, the US uh, uh, trade uh, tariffs, Brexit, the Italian debt, the reduction in quantitative easing, as you said, all of those things. And what impact will that have on economic reunification? Again, should there be a crash in the South? But I, I do want to thank you for your presentation, because I think, <coughs> and I came especially for this, because I think this is where we need to be at. And I think as Jim said as well, in terms of you know, teasing out all of the stuff in terms of health, in terms of pensions and all that, while you might think they're boring conversations, they're very, very relative. And I think there's one thing that we need to learn from Brexit is that, you know, this idea of Brexit and you know what it might mean to the National Health Service or whatever, I think people have learned from that. And if we're going to be continuing this conversation, which certainly uh, I hope we do, um, we need, we almost need to bore people with the minutia in it so that there's a certainty there and that there's a certainty for unionists as well. Mm. We can't be having this conversation at all. And just to ask you, are there any uh, economic papers done from a unionist perspective of um, supporting the union or otherwise? Just, mm. Is there anything, anything written? There's about, Sorry, three, there's about three biggies there. For yes, yes, okay. <laughs> I'll, I, remind me which, which ones I could get. Okay, let's deal with the regional issue. I actually had a chance to, um, to have a chat with uh, a, a southern government minister about 18 months ago about this, who, who, who made the point, which I think is correct, which is that the south has not done regional policy well, but the north has done it worse. Uh, so in Derry, we are envious of Galway. And Limerick and Galway are significantly stronger places, I think, than Derry, though I'm not an expert. So, yes, I mean, I think there is, I think that Anglo-Saxon economies don't do regional development very well. And in England, transport links, almost all the good ones go north-south and the bad ones go east-west. And we, in a sense, we've got that inherited within Ireland as well, which we, don't, we just don't do east-west transport links generally very well. And it requires people to be assertive in politics. And Cork has been pretty assertive in the South. Limerick has been, I think. In the North, my feeling is, and I'll probably offend half the audience here, that on the Northern Ireland executive, people on the West have not been sufficiently strong in the executive to fight their corner. And that the West of you know, the West of the Band, basically, has not done very well out of having ministers in the Northern Ireland Executive. And I don't understand why people have put up with that, to be blunt about it. I just do not understand that. I mean, you know, it's just absurd. So in terms of regional policy, we just don't do regional policy very well in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, I, th I just, well, to repeat what I've said, I, don't th I think it's done better in the South. But I mean... The trouble is you're talking about fast sums of money, aren't you? I mean, to get a real... The bad decisions have been taken in the past to close rail connections. How do you reinstate those rail connections now? Because it just costs so much money. I mean, it's, there's a promise of a billion euro on the road link between Derry and Dublin. That still doesn't deal with large amounts of the West. It still won't give you decent road links in much of Donegal. So... And, and it's not just about that, it's also about skills, and we don't invest enough in the skills in the West, so, sorry, that's probably not a very okay. effective the answer. The crash? The crash, yes. I, t I, I, I have been expecting a crash for the last three years. Uh, there's an argument which says that the 2008 crash was the result of the 2000 crash. Because broadly what happened, when you had the dot-com bubble collapse back in 99, 2000, the policymakers in the, the central banks reduced interest rates substantially, and we lived off fairly low interest rates. Low interest rates mean people borrow too much and they can't afford to repay, and then you've got 2008 because you also didn't have effective regulation around the, the lending. And then we've responded to it by making money even cheaper. And there was a figure for the UK published a couple of days ago which said 
that the poorest 10% of the population in the UK spent 2.6 times more than they earned last year. Now, if that figure is correct, then I, I, you know, I, it's just astonishing. I mean, you know, we, we've got low-income households that are desperately overborrowed. That means you can expect there will be significant property problems. How you move, you should, it is bad economically to have money that's basically free. It, is just, it just promotes bad policy outcomes. You know, you don't want that. You don't want, you know, you need, there has to be a price, there has to be a pain for borrowing. Otherwise, you know, it, it, it just encourages people to do the wrong things, the things that aren't economically positive in terms of outcomes. So, yes, I do think, I think, and, and quantitative easing created bubbles in terms of stock markets and in terms of property prices in Dublin as well as in London. And, and I don't think that will end well. Um, and, you know, I've made my own personal finance decisions on the back of the fact that I, th I think that one should at very least hedge one's risk in terms of managing one's own money, you know, at the possibility that stock markets will be badly hit, which means our pension fund investments will decrease in size, uh, which means property might be worth less. How, what does that mean in terms of north-south reunification? I haven't got a clue, really. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it's, we, we just, policy making has just gone wrong, and I don't think that Trump is helping. I think the trade wars create a very bad risk. Maybe a lot of things that are going on are just people talking bluff. Maybe things will get sorted out. Maybe Trump will actually push people into a room where they do deals with the EU and Japan, et cetera, that are okay in the end. But maybe they won't be. And equally, you know, if Trump's numbers go bad, then what do presidents do when their numbers go bad? They go to war. And, you know, there's lots of opportunities going for war. That doesn't do very much good for the people involved or for financial markets, you know, so. Right, that was cheery. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, about, what about the third one, which was uh, uh, the unionist economic case for, for the UK. Yeah, but, I mean, people do write about this. Es Esmond Burney, there's a, there's a website, what is it? I don't, don't know what it's called now. There's, uh, Esmond Burney writes about this stuff. Yes, there are. Um, B-I-R-N-I-E. Yeah. Um, Esmond Burney is one of the more intelligent unionist economists. There is a fear amongst economists because broadly, if they operate in the North, the organisations that fund them tend to be controlled by unionists. So there's a reluctance to be particularly outspoken in terms of talking about the economic impacts. It was very interesting, the responses I had. I think Esmond was the only person, really, who came back. Oh, no, there's two people. I sent this out to dozens of people, and I had lots of really intelligent comments from economists, and I've assumed that most of them didn't want to be named, so I won't. But, you know, sort of like the, the best economists in the North have come back to me with sensible comments. Esmond came back very critical, saying basically, part, essentially what he's saying is, well, it's about politics, it's not about economics. But also he's saying that I underestimated the cost, the impact of the job losses within the public sector. Um, the, the unionist argument essentially is the north-south economy, economic links don't matter very much. It's the east-west ones that matter a lot. But we can never be cost competitive in east-west terms, you know, because you've got all those infrastructure and transport problems. Um, the other person who was very, very, very critical was the chairman of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, and he, he basically told me to go and do something else with my life. <laughs> Which we'll allow you to do quite soon here. <laughs> Folks, we've been here an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, is there... There's no reason why we have to end, but just I know people sometimes get a bit worn out. So let's say we'll we'll give it another ten minutes and then let everybody escape. Is that okay? Ten minutes if it goes that far. Jerry and Jerry. Just very quickly, thanks, Paul, for, for that um, exploration of, of a, an issue that I think we, we need to constantly discuss here. Um, on hopeful note, um, I think we leave we have a number of precedents here that, that are useful to work from. Um, the first is that, that initiative from the 1990s about corridors. Um, it was developed, I know George Quigley had worked on that, and it, was, it rolled out effectively to an extent. 
um, I mean, that's something I think we've lost um, in terms of, of what, what we what we need between Belfast and Dublin, and indeed between Derry and Limerick, for example. And the second thing is, um, and, and certainly bankrolled by the EU, which is which I think will continue to be an option. The second thing is the border itself. Um, how do we dis dissolve the um, the difficulties around the economic activity around the border. Um, I know there was quite a lot of work done on that in the late 1990s and 2000s. Um, how do we network um, Sligo and Enniskill and Letterkenny and Derry? And one that I'm particularly familiar with is Murray and Dundalk, where the disconnect there is quite obvious. And I think that that, that dissolution of the border um, as, as an active strategy um, should be focused on as well as this idea that of returning to possibly the, the EU financing corridors that will assist economic activity across the island. Which, which, which actually draws me to the fact that the question before that I didn't answer was about the ECB. And uh, in terms of the European Central Bank, it is reactive, not proactive. If you ask for money and you put up a decent case for the right things, it will invest. So it has, for example, invested in Ulster University, and it will invest in road schemes. I mean, I've never quite understood the argument that we shouldn't have toll roads, actually. I mean, I object to it taking two hours for me to travel between Derry and Belfast. I don't object to the idea of paying to go down to Dublin. Um, so. Personally, I, and that's the type of thing that ECB would probably be attracted to paying. In terms of West Coast, I mean, dear God, I mean, trying to get anywhere, going north, south, and the west, I mean, it just doesn't work. You know, you have to go east and then go back well, out west. I mean, it's just altogether mad. Um, and, and how much you'd have to spend to develop that. But actually, you, you, you know, if you're in Belfast, I understand the comments about the border, and clearly partition has been a major destructive thing economically, as well as politically, as well as socially in Ireland. But actually, the border pretty well doesn't exist for us in Derry. You know, it's, it's, I, I, I might go across several times a day. Most people live in Derry, go across several times a day. We don't even notice, you know, it just, it doesn't matter. And they take the sterling. I mean, it does, and, and traders in Derry take euro, it doesn't, it just, is not an issue on a day-to-day -day basis in Derry. I don't know about Newry, and I don't know about the relationship with Newry and Dundalk. Belfast is a different world. I mean, Belfast is just a different place from Derry. You know, there is real cultural difference between the east and west of Northern Maybe Ireland. <laughs> uh, we'll take probably just one more second chance, Jerry. I'm back on the second bit. So, uh, Paul, it's interesting there, in terms of your reference to the, uh, the economists, and then you know, that, they, that they don't actually uh, speak out mm -hmm. and they want to appear um, as if they can take one side or another. And then you said there that Sinn Féin, obviously, anything Sinn Féin put forward might be accepted as well. Uh, I noticed even Philip Hammond there uh, last week said that the North was leading the way in terms of economic growth uh, within the UK. I, I did notice that three local economists did call out in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Buchanan, hmm. uh, from uh, Ulster University, and um, Angela McGowan, and Angela McGowan did as well. Angela McGowan also. Um, however, none of those people, Angela McGowan included, have called for a border poll or, or a united Ireland. So if it isn't Sinn Féin, and if the SDLP and the Dublin government are saying now isn't the right time for a border poll, mm -hmm. and if these economists won't call it out for them, who will and who can't? Okay, let's, let's, let's start with the politics of it, okay? I come from a political background where you don't call for something which, if it happens, you're going to lose, okay? It, for me, it does not fly. You call for a border poll when you're going to win, not when you're going to lose. And if we have a border poll now, we will lose, and then we lose the chance for years. So sorry, anyone in this room that is a Sinn Féin member, I'm sorry for, to upset you, but I just think that strategy is wrong. As sim simple as that. Wait the time wait for Brexit to hit, for the impact to be felt, for people to see that the South can survive Brexit and the North can't. That is when the politics are right to have a border poll and to win it. That's my opinion. In terms of the economist viewpoint, I might not have explained myself sufficiently well. 
it's not that they don't want to appear partisan. It's the fact that the unionists control the purse strings. Yeah. And if they say a united Ireland makes sense, then they are in a lot of difficulty. I had a conversation with someone senior in one of the Northern Ireland business bodies the other day who said there's only two business bodies that are willing to say Brexit is a bad idea because every other business organisation has been told, in effect, by the DUP, mm -hmm. you say that, you are in real difficulty with us. And oh, by the way, the CBEs, the dames, the knighthoods that would otherwise follow are not going to come to you. There is real prestige pressure on the business organisations not to tell the truth about Brexit. So if you think they're not going to tell the truth about Brexit, what do you think they're going to say about United Ireland? And that applies just as much with the economy schools, all the big firms. They get money out of the Northern Ireland government. And the Northern Ireland government at the moment is controlled by unionists, you know? So in well, other words, you have, you have no answer to his question. Ask the question again then. Well, if it's not The Economist, if it's not Sinn Féin, if it's not all these other things, who the hell is it? Well, okay, we're, we're at the beginning. We're not at the end point, okay? This is not the moment where we're going to win a border poll. Yeah, maybe there's going to be a border poll called next week, but we lose it. So let's plan for when we get the border poll. And if Sinn Féin call for the border poll and no one else supports it, it will be lost. That's simple. Sinn Féin has not got the numbers. And you have to win it both sides of the border. You know, it has to be one in the south. And we have to make the argument about the subvention in the south, just as much as we have to make it in the north. And so there has to be a broad political campaign. You know, that's not necessarily where I come from politically. But it has, we have to win people over. So there has, this has to be the beginning of a campaign where we win people over in different parties and not be so protective about it being under the ownership of one part of the political sphere. We have to win people over and get them on side and then make it a broad campaign. That's the only way it will win. And I'm going to stop it there, even though there's a hair running around this room that we could follow for another while. Uh, Paul, that was very, very stimulating. I will, and I will stay here because it took me two okay. and a half, three hours to get over here. Well, so you I'm stop, quite happy stop, to stop stay. complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. That was very, very good. And the funny thing about it is, you know, sometimes people think that economics is something up there that.